Well, thank you so much. So I think, yeah, we, you know, as we draw an analogy, we are probably at a stage where digital transformation was 10, 15 years back. Like, we have ways to do it, but I think the change management concept as well as the actual execution of these is going to play a very critical role. So with that, my second question is, and maybe I'll start with Dan, you first, what are some of the most effective ways to get to net zero? And how do you think different jurisdictions are handling this challenge? That's not a small question, as you might <laughs> expect. So I'll talk a little bit about sort of approaches, and I'm interested in Brian's sort of take on this. Maybe we can get sort of a banter back and forth. But I mean, um, one, one of the big debates we're having in Canada right now is what is the role of sort of a comprehensive top-tier policy like a carbon tax? Mm -hmm. And I think the economists, or everyone will agree, that's the best way to drive change, put signals into the marketplace. The problem is, is that when you map the things like carbon tax and ramping up to the level they actually have to get to drive real deep change, it's really difficult politically, and we're seeing that play out right now. So I think, you know, you know that's a... Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the clear tools, one of the clear best tools. Part of the problem is also is we have incumbent industries that are making an awful lot of money right now. And so some of those carbon taxes can't wrap up quick enough so the private sector has enough time to, to pivot. Mm -hmm. So what we're seeing is, without saying it, gover governments deciding what those future systems need to look like. So think of personal um, transportation. Governments have essentially defined what the future system is going to look like, and it's not going to be an internal combustion engine. Mm -hmm. Now, they implement that using a, um, uh, you know, a zero a Z mandate, a zero emission fuel mandate. But the best tools that we're convinced is starting in the future, understand there's more certainty than uncertainty about what those winning systems are going to be, and they'll build like pathways to them. But it's a very different concept than what we've used to for 30 years, which was simply putting policy signals into the marketplace and allowing the market to figure out how we just reduce emissions. Uh, well, let me just kick off some responses by saying I, I don't buy that carbon taxes are the best policy instrument. And I, I get that people can say, well, economists have analyzed carbon taxes and they're very efficient. It may be, but the, the fundamental thing one has to realize is that um, politics matter and political signals matter. And that means that industries have to look at, at the, um, what's out in front of them and be convinced that that fiscal regime, whatever it may be, will be around. For instance, they can't be saying, well, you know, this carbon tax is a, a real uh, serious problem and it would move, uh, move change unless the government changes, which it always does. Um, so in terms of thinking about policies, they need to be structured in a way where people really, really believe them and are committed to, to making changes based on them. You know, in, in many instances, for example, it's a, it's a kind of a, a view in, in corporate America or corporate Canada that you don't change what you do because of taxes. Taxes are ephemeral fundamentally and they change. And the carbon tax um, has had challenges all over the place. There's a series of other policies which generally have had, um, maybe I'll call it a more robust history, although their own ups and downs, things like, like mandates. And, and now we see the generosity of the, uh, the IRA, which, which is putting out basically 10-year, fully funded, fixed, fixed pay to people. Those are things that can motivate action um, for people who are um, concerned about whether politics change, as, as I think almost any, any investor would be. Um, so I'll, I'll offer that on the policy front, that we need to have policies that are not just theoretically sustainable, but really sustainable in the honest view of people out there risking their money. Okay, so I was reading an article on Harvard Business Review and it said to be a successful session chair or moderator for a panel, you have to start some controversy among the panelists. I think I've just, <laughs> think I've just started that and I would like to fuel this further. So, <laughs> so we all know that Canada has spent a lot of time in developing the clean fuel regulations. And uh, now that we've seen a lot of net zero momentum in last three to four years, um, what do you think is the role of clean fuel regulation in shaping up the net zero targets? Or... 
just suggested to Brian that I went first and he could ref refute me because I think we have a little bit of a different um, view on this, but it's mostly temporal. Well, we, it, it's hard to say. You probably didn't hear, but my, my answer fully convinced Dan on, uh, on, uh, on carbon taxes. Um, in terms of the, the clean fuel standard, you know, honestly, I can't speak to Canadian clean fuel standard much. It's not actually at a scale where it's, it's moving the needle and in some sense, from, whatever I, from what I understand, it's not entirely designed to move the needle soon. But what I can talk about is the California low carbon fuel standard, which um, has built up now. And there, were, there has been criticism of these clean fuel standards that they can leave, um, leave people looking for just incremental small solutions. And a wrap on it would have been oh my gosh, all the clean fuel standard is going to do is, is bring in some corn ethanol for a little bit and then it'll be stuck. And <clears throat> the California low carbon fuel standard looked a little bit like that would be what would happen. Um, and, and, um, and then it really kicked into gear. Um, and it kicked into gear not only from the um, requirements ramping up, but from the pr production growing vastly faster than the um, than the the requirements, so California is seeing a world now where refineries are converting to renewable diesel to supply the market, where there's so much supply, prices have collapsed, and they're having to turn up requirements, and looking at a, a 30 percent reduction in the carbon intensity of fuels in the state uh, over the next say eight years. Um, it's a an unbelievable success and one that, I have to admit to my surprise, is actually delivering fuels that are going to fit net zero, not just small incremental fuels. And it's even delivering a focus in conventional corn ethanol on things like getting CCS in place to bring their emissions down to near zero. I'll, t I'll take a theoretical other side of the coin approach and really just to emphasize some of the points that you recognize, Brian. And but I'll, I'll set up that notion of a dead-end pathway again. So at the transition accelerator and then at zero advisory body, you know, we describe a dead-end pathway as something that you put in place, likely a technology, a technology platform, but it could be a business model that is very attractive because it reduces emissions. But that technology or that business model actually can't legitimately be part of a net zero economy because you, you can't get past a certain emissions reductions and get it to zero. So here's, so here's an example. If we're trying to decarbonize uh, or get zero emissions out of heavy duty trucking, um, if we were to replace our diesel with some type of uh, natural gas, that would feel really, really good in the short term because we're reducing our emissions dramatically. But at the end of the day, you would have to invest massively into new kit, trucks, distribution systems, and so on, you reduce your emissions, and then you can't get them to zero, so you have to turn around and retool it all again. You have to put something else in, whether it's hydrogen or something. So that's the concept of a dead-end pathway. And so the risk, unless it's done well, and Brian just you know, implied that it is done well in the States, is you're on a clean fuel standard, is you're getting people to invest massively to reduce the carbon intensity of their liquid fuels, um, at least in, this, you know, in Canada. Um, but at some point, that whole platform has to be replaced. The problem is the internal combustion engine. And then people could say, well, it's a question of scale. When we've done the, you know, I'd say the mass balance of how much land that we would need and what kit we would need in order to create you know, true zero emissions liquid fuels, we just don't think the system's in place. We don't think there's a land base in, in place, just using the ethanol example. So we think there's a risk that the clean fuel standard um, is incenting massive amounts of investment into reducing emissions. That's really a dated paradigm. And we should be thinking about more truer pathways that are incenting technologies, business models that can actually truly be compatible with net zero, which is really at zero emissions at, at point of use. So. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to come in on this. I think, um, first of all, I'm going to have to disagree with Dan, but before I do, I'm going to... There, there's a pattern emerging here, actually. So, <laughs> the... But, but I, I, on something like light-duty vehicles, it seems quite clear that electrification has won, it's, it's going to be effective, and investing money in fuels to deliver for light-duty vehicles has um, certainly lost the attention of investors and governments, uh, probably quite rightfully. Um, that, that said, if you take a look at 
uh, again, what's happened in the, with the clean fuel standard, surprises happen with technology. So Dan picked out my favorite example of a, of a dead-end pathway, which was what happens if you take heavy trucks and you say, let's convert them to natural gas. We're stuck. We have, we have no space moving forward. Um, and, and just to illustrate that, let's, let's look at what's happened in California with, uh, with uh, heavy-duty heavy trucks, and they, they're switched to natural gas, which indeed they have done. But over the last five years, they've switched entirely out of um, uh, natural gas, as has public transportation systems, toward renewable natural gas, and in fact to carbon negative renewable natural gas. And I'll just put in a plug here, Iogen is one of the largest suppliers of carbon negative renewable natural gas into the California market, so I, I know slightly of where I speak. And that, that market is, um, is actually, um, has, is delivering real net zero. Now, I'm not sure that's going to be a long-term solution, um, but what it has done is, is support infrastructure underneath it that is, is going to become a, a longer-term solution, as, as maybe the push to renewable diesel has enabled, uh, enabled SAF. Can I even riff on that a little bit? <laughs> you know, the devil sort of in the details, and I think you know, one, one thing I do agree with you, Brian, I think you said it quite eloquently early on, is like, Politics matters. Like these things have to work in the real world, and taking the economist view of, you know, just put a price signal into the market, and everything will take care of itself. So I'll give sort of one example of heavy trucking decarbonization. Um, you know, it, it looks like you're doing some great business in, in California. That's great. In the Canadian context, I think you have to start with like, what are all the options to decarbonize heavy trucking? Not just like, how do you advance a certain fuel type? So in Canada, we can we can make hydrogen zero emission fuel at point of use. Uh, from natural gas, you know, blue hydrogen, with new auto thermal reforming technologies, the carbon intensity can be lower than many of the green hydrogens. So, like, what a great thing for Canada to try and come up with a heavy trucking system in Canada that's based on hydrogen, because we're actually creating a forward permanent runway to exploit our, nat our fossil fuels in a way that is completely compatible with natural gas. So our philosophy is less like trying to force a fuel um, and more like what are the full suite of criteria we should be considering in terms of what the solutions are, what we're trying to accomplish, which this case is zero, zero emission trucking, which would lead us to, certainly in the West, to, uh, to blue hydrogen. So, yeah. mm -hmm. Thank you. And I guess if I can add, could, yeah. Um, could I just, I'm, I'm just going to keep up my banter if okay, you don't you have, mind. Yeah, one minute. Um, <laughs> I, I do think it's worth saying about the, um, about the low carbon fuel standard, it, it's not been about forcing a solution at all. They're entirely technology neutral. So the shift from natural gas into renewable natural gas happened just based on the price signal that they had. Um, but I, I, I do, as you were talking about the political stability, I think it's worth keeping in mind that at the, at the, at the top of corporate Canada and corporate America are people who who can, through their actions, influence, um, influence regulations, and sometimes they can influence them by not doing stuff. And I think one of the best examples of that is in, um, is in California, where the Californians uh, mandated 10% zero emission vehicles um, a d more than a decade ago. And uh, D Detroit's um, response to that was essentially saying, look, there's only so many golf carts we can produce, and we'll have to, we'll have to uh, reduce the supply of actual vehicles to California. Um, is that what you want, Mr. Governor? And the, and the governor caved. And it's only been the arrival of, um, uh, of really good electric vehicles that's actually changed that possibility. And even to riff on that, I mean, I don't think our current fuel standard, like in Canada, what we're doing okay. here, it's, the policy signal isn't strong enough to actually force the system change that you have getting in the states, and that's part of the problem, right? It's basically the, the, the you know, the verve of implementability. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, yeah, I, uh, I Brian, and then I'll move I, on to I, the new topic before it gets too heated here. So just want to add that, like, I see from, uh, you know, uh, clean fuel regulations, California, like, okay, 
it may be a stepping stone for transportation, but because of transformation, but because of that, we have seen changes at, on many other fronts. For example, uh, carbon footprinting of different businesses and anyone who does scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions for clients here, which is, I guess, me. Like, what we've seen is that California has been also leader in coming up with new regulations to move from spend-based method to more life cycle analysis. And I feel like th those are all the learnings that they've done from clean fuel regulation or low carbon fuel standard, which they are now leading path in other ways to do this transformation and get to net zero. So with that, I'll maybe move on to the next question and uh, Brian probably will make you happy. Like what, <laughs> what is the role of bioenergy in getting to net zero? And do you think it can play a bigger role? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> offer up um, my view. F first of all, it's worth saying that um, there's a whole number of um, plans that people have laid out for net zero. Probably the two most prominent are the IEAs and the U.S. strategy for the, for, for the energy future. Um, in, in both of them, they see transforming our energy economy as about three quarters of the overall solution. A big share of that is in electrification or in reducing the carbon intensity of electrification. Um, the next component of that though is, is in low carbon fuels and bioenergy is widely expected to play an important role in that because if you're going to burn SAF uh, and release that carbon into the atmosphere, if you want to be in a net zero world, you want that carbon to be biogenic, which means you want it to be a biofuel. We also heard a great story about the benefits of BACS, um, bioenergy carbon capture and storage. Uh, Bex offers uh, an ability to both deliver an energy source, it could be a fuel or it could be electricity, and remove carbon from the atmosphere. And in, in both, in pretty much every um, main scenario, uh, Bex plays a significant role. Um, if I was going to sort of estimate the role that, that these things would say, bioenergy will play maybe 10 to 20 percent uh, as uh, a portion of net zero, which on its own is a huge amount. Um, that'll come from its delivery of BECs and its delivery of low carbon fuels uh, and potentially some, some hydrogen. Um, my general guess is there's a lot more potential than people estimate. Um, for those of you who've, who've followed it, the U.S. has, uh, has created this billion ton study to look at their overall availability of bioenergy resources in the United States. We heard a billion tons for less than $60 a ton. Um, astoundingly, if you took that billion tons and actually made it into hydrogen, um, which is an entirely doable type of thing to do, you would supply roughly what the United States is thinking it needs for hydrogen, but instead of 10%, like they were expecting for bioenergy's contribution, you did deliver 25% of the whole net zero requirements. So there are the resources there, um, and I, I firmly believe the technology is there, and we will see bioenergy being a bigger player. Okay, thanks. I would, I would sort of not disagree with anything on that, but put it through that notion, that other lens of implementability and what do we want Canada to look like, mm -hmm. right? Again, for 30 years, we've been focusing on emissions reduction. Now we know that climate change is not really about emissions reduction, it's about future competitiveness as well. And all of our major trading partners and, and competitors are acting extremely aggressively and unconventionally to position their country to build the sectors to supply chains to companies so they can win economically. You just have to take a look at China, right? They've been snapping up supply chains for 10 years, mm -hmm. even as they played a rear guard on in international negotiations, um, IRA and estates and so on, right? So, to, you know, we really need to put that lens on, you know, what are the pathways to get Canada to net zero, but also where's that going to position Canada economically? One of the things, certainly out west, I'm from, I just happen to be from Alberta, you know, exporting energy is a really big deal for that province. So there's one thing about decarbonizing the province, and the other is like, how are we going to fill the hole that is, the, you know, um, sort of in our provincial budget? And um, so the concept of exporting hydrogen is a great thing. Mm -hmm. There's lots of activity going on of making it and, and uh, deals being cut between the international markets as we speak right now. So to me, it's not just that notion of like what role can, can, can bio play, but like what are the best options for Canada to, to keep up its competitiveness and, uh, and exports. So it's a trade-off at some point. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean there's no opportunities in bio at all, but 
um, I think that's the lens that we always put things through is the, that real world lens of let's make sure that we can win economically, not just get to net zero. Uh, those are yeah, I, I just I just like to offer something on that. Um, Canada has obviously great bioenergy resources because we have so much land, and we have great conventional energy resources. One of the challenges for for blue hydrogen and fossil-based hydrogen has always been that they don't quite get to zero emission. They actually need to be paired with some form of emissions reduction or carbon dioxide removal. And, and in fact, for Canada, um, the idea of being able to produce zero carbon hydrogen uh, through blue hydrogen is almost certainly most effectively dealt with by including some bioenergy resources in there to, to take not quite zero and and you know most of the numbers for blue hydrogen are 20 percent emissions but it's really possible to take blue hydrogen down to absolutely zero emissions with a share of bioenergy okay well, thank you for the great discussion and i see we are at zero time right now so i have to move on so i had i also wanted to have a discussion on like consumer choice in it like we've talked about corporate choices maybe or like regulations and policy and i know we don't have time but just wanted to mention that i was very happy to see that like how can we offset our own carbon footprint and uh, you know i flew in here from toronto and as i was walking out of the airport i was like what can i do to reduce my carbon footprint and i'm like okay i have time i'm going to take public transport rather than taking taxi so I think it was a good decision because it only cost me $3.70 versus $45. But I think it was also nice to, you know, see that like as a consumer, we need to make small, small decisions, which are actually always thinking about how can we move to net zero by making the choices that we do on a daily basis. So to really support this journey. So with that, I don't know if you have time for any question answer, but I'll let Jeff. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Anjana. Thanks very much. That was a really good panel, and I really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah.